Glad you could join me today. Today I want to talk about the house rules. You know, when you go over to someone's house, uh, sometimes they'll say, well, make yourself the home. Well, maybe they don't know exactly what, that's, what that means to some people. But you know, when you go to another country, you better consider the rules that they have. You better know what their signs mean when you're driving down the road. Or if you are going to play a sport, you need to have rules. And of course, children in the home need to have rules as well. So I want to talk today about the house rules that we have for us as New Testament Christians. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who, upon being saved, they're confused as to what is expected of them. In fact, I sometimes pass out a tract, uh, The God's Simple Plan of Salvation, which presents the gospel clearly. And at the end of that tract, it uh, encourages people to, um, to read their Bibles, to pray, and to witness, which are good things. But you have to take it from there because when you talk about reading the Bible, the Bible is a huge book. Mine's about that thick. My Catholic Bible is about that thick, which has not only the 66 books of the Bible, but also all the traditions and the other writings that the Roman Catholic Church has added to it. But this is a pretty big book, and if a person were to were told to start reading the Bible, and he or she started reading Genesis, and they got to chapter 5, they'd come across genealogies. And, of course, uh, that might throw them a little bit. A little, read a little bit more, and they come to chapter 10, genealogies. So, so, suppose they go to Matthew chapter 1, and the New Testament, and they come across genealogies as well. And they think, man, that's kind of a boring book. And so it's important for us to help people who have come to know the Lord as their personal Savior by believing that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. It's, that's what makes a person a Christian when that individual trusts in Christ alone apart from his or her good works. So we want to talk about that, that not only is it important for us to know where we're going to find the rules for our living for today, but also with reference to praying. Uh, some people are given the idea that prayer is nothing more than asking and receiving. In fact, there was a man a number of years ago, he wrote a whole book on asking and receiving. Well, that's just one part of our communication with God. There are eight ways to communicate with God, and you need to use all, all, all eight of them. Uh, there's worship, there's praise, there's thanksgiving, there's supplication, intercession, asking in Christ's name, there's confession when necessary, and sometimes making vows. Those are eight ways you can communicate with God. And... Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that's available to them and that's what they can do to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. Uh, Hebrews 13, 15, 16 talks about offering praise and thanksgiving to God. And there's a, actually five spiritual gifts that a Christian can and should offer up to God in contrast to the bloody sacrifices that the Old Testament believers were required uh, to give as a result of their sinning. Now, perhaps you have never... Um, trusted in Christ as your Savior. If you haven't, today is the day that I want to help you make sure that you're saved. Uh, maybe you lack assurance of your salvation. Uh, I did for many years myself. I knew the facts of the gospel. I agreed with the facts of the gospel, but I was always trying to add something else to the gospel message just as an added insurance measure. But you see, whenever you add works, good works to faith, you nullify the whole thing. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 too, when he says there are people who believe in vain. They either add to the requirements that God has placed upon us as individuals to be saved, or they subtract from the message of the gospel or confuse it. See? And there's a lot of people, I think, who are professing Christians who don't possess eternal life. That is God's quality of life right now. So we want to help you understand where you need to go if you're a new Christian, or maybe you've been saved for a while, but you've been, you were struggling like I did for quite a long time. Even as I went through college, I was saved. Um, came to have assurance of my salvation, but it wasn't until a few years later when somebody explained, one of my teachers in seminary explained to me this idea of the rules for living that God has given to us as grace believers. Uh, I, you know, I read the Old Testament and I knew how the people in the Old Testament used to bring animal sacrifices to God. They had certain dietary restrictions. They had to observe the Sabbath day, the seventh, and if they did anything on the Sabbath, they could be killed. In fact, one man was stoned to death because he violated the Sabbath. Well, 
you know, we can distinguish between the Old and the New Testament. We can find in the Old Testament there were rules that were quite different than they are in the New Testament. And so we want to try to explain that to you in hopes that you will realize, okay, now that I'm saved, this is what I need to study primarily for my spiritual growth and development. Now, we've told you that all scriptures God breathe. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, in order that the man or the woman of God might be perfect, that is mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, all of the Bible is for us, but not all of it is addressed to us. And if we don't make that distinction, we're going to have a lot of problems. For example, you cannot, as a New Testament Christian, claim Old Testament promises that were given to the Jews exclusively. If you try to do that, you're going to be very disappointed. Uh, as I think about these health, wealth, happiness preachers, uh, they're telling people, now if you bring in your tithes to the church, or that's what some pastors do, but these radio TV guys, they'll say, now send me X number of dollars. Though God told me to tell you to give this X number of uh, amount of money, and then you trust God to bring in the rest of it. So they get themselves out of it. And what they do is they will take Old Testament passages and promises that were given to the Jews, who could expect health, wealth, and happiness if they kept the Mosaic Law. Uh, you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 in the first 14 verses. It says, If you Jews keep the Mosaic Law as you said you would, then these are the blessings that will come upon you. But if you don't, if you violate them, then verses 15 through 68, I believe it is, all these curses are going to come, up, come upon you. And that's why even to this very day, many Jews are still suffering because they broke the law of Moses. They didn't keep the sabbatical year. That's why they went into captivity for 70 years, because they violated, violated it for 490 years. But God sent them into captivity. Then when the Messiah came uh, 2,000 years ago, they rejected him. He was, didn't meet their expectations. And so they rejected him. They had the Romans kill him. And so God holds not only the Jews, but the Romans, and all of us responsible, actually, for the death of Jesus Christ. Now, we need to understand that after Christ died on the cross for our sins and was buried for three days and three nights, he rose again bodily from the dead. He made appearances to over 500 witnesses over a 40-day period of time before ascending back into heaven. Now, when he ascended up into heaven, he gave spiritual gifts to people here on earth that constitute the church that, at that time and which would be even up to the present time. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11, it says that he, when Christ ascended up in heaven, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers to the church to equip these people, the other Christians, for their work of ministry. Now, too often in churches, you'll go there and you'll have, you know, staff or whatever. They're doing basically all the work. Once in a while, they get some volunteers, but the rest of the people are basically pew warmers and bill payers. And maybe you go to a church and maybe you're not aware of the fact that you have a spiritual gift that needs to be exercised in love. And when you do that, you're going to find the most fulfillment in your life while you're here on planet Earth. Now, we believe, as we've shared with you in the past, that apostles were the foundation layers, Ephesians 2.20. And also, the prophets, they were the ones who received information from God before the New Testament was completed. But once the scriptures are completed, their office is no longer needed. We're not getting any more information from God. These guys who claim to be prophets, there was a guy, C. Peter Wagner, who uh, started the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. And there's a lot of people that are in this group. And uh, they're claiming that, you know, God is giving new added revelation that supersedes what we find within the pages of the scripture say it does not. Uh, you see, cults, as I kind of identify them, are those that add to the scriptures. And uh, I remember there was a bishop in one of the churches out in California, and uh, he told me that Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, really bothered him because they, his, the group to which he belonged, a cult, was adding to the scriptures. And if you add to or subtract from it, if you change the gospel message or the way of salvation, the method of salvation, then you are in big trouble with God. So we believe that the apostles and prophets are no longer needed today, but evangelists, which are like the... Um, obstetricians who bring the babies into the world, and then the pastor teachers are like the pediatricians who take the new Christians and help them grow spiritually. I happen to believe that my gift is that of a pastor teacher. I'm not an overseer or a bishop right at the moment. I do believe I have a relative degree of spiritual maturity, but I don't want to get, get the idea that I know everything there is to know, because the more I study, the more I realize how little I know. And I sometimes ask myself, well, why do I keep studying? 
Well, because I want to keep growing. I want to keep becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And, want to, and I want to help you, if you're teachable and willing to change when necessary, so that you, in turn, will take what I'm sharing with you right now, and you will find faithful people to whom you can pass on this information, and they can pass it on to other people. You see, if we don't pass this information on to others, uh, the church is going to die out. There are many churches every day that are closing up. Uh, there's a lot of false churches, apostate churches that have departed from the scriptures. And so it's important for us, as, until Jesus Christ comes back at the time of the rapture, to keep on proclaiming the gospel concerning Christ, that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Now the bodily resurrection is essential to the gospel message. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he says, I insist that the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ be a part of the gospel for which I am suffering persecution. Uh, Paul, when he got in trouble with the, the religious leaders, he says, in hope of the resurrection, I am being persecuted. And on one occasion, he was with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels or the resurrection. The Pharisees did. And so he says, well, I'm a Pharisee. I, I believe in the resurrection. And so the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is an essential part of the gospel that we must present to people in order for them to be saved. Just recently, I watched a, a video on uh, YouTube. And a young man who is an Orthodox Jew was talking to this uh, pastor, this Christian pastor, and they were talking about uh, Christianity and Judaism and so forth. And this pastor talked about the gospel, although he never elucidated as to what it is, because he happens, to, I know, to believe in lordship in exchange for salvation. But I wish he would have said to him, you know, as this young Orthodox Jewish fellow said on his program, we don't believe in the deity of Christ. Well, that's why Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 says, If you Jews confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, meaning God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, implying that he died for your sins like he did for the rest of us, then you're going to be saved. You see, without a Jew's acknowledging and admitting the deity of Jesus Christ, he or she cannot be saved. Now, the problem with sometimes uh, non-Jewish people is they have a lot of other gods that they need to get rid of. See? But with a Jew, the problem is basically he doesn't believe or she doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, this individual who this um, pastor was talking to me, he did ascribe the fact that Jesus Christ is indeed God. But uh, in fact, in the tribulation time, that the last three and a half years of the tribulation are going to be the time of Jacob's trouble when God is going to deal very specifically with the Jews, primarily through the trumpet judgments that are mentioned in the book of the Revelation, to bring these people to himself. And of course, the rebels are going to get weeded out, but the surviving Jews who survive that uh, last three and a half years of the tribulation, all of those are going to be believers. And it says all Israel, that is the surviving ones, are going to be believers, and they are ones who are going to inherit the kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to set up here on this earth for 1,000 years. Now that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, it's mentioned, what is it, six times, seven times in six verses, Revelation chapter 20. It's a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. This new world order that is being talked about today and everybody wants to bring it in, the man's world order, it's only going to last for seven years and that whole period of time is going to be nothing but disaster except the very, very beginning of it when the Antichrist is going to have a false peace after which uh, all hell's going to break loose, so to speak, on planet Earth. Uh, the Jews will be protected for the first three and a half years by the Antichrist. But the last three and a half years, when they refuse to bow down and acknowledge that he is God, they have to flee into the wilderness. But we've talked about that in another occasion, so you have to look at some of the others if you're interested in that. Now, when we talk about, we must not confuse the message of salvation or the method of salvation with the rules for living. Now, sometimes those who teach lordship in exchange for salvation mean well, but you can't put the rules for living as requirements or conditions for being saved. And we talked about this recently about uh, you can't do that. The plan of salvation is very simple. Now, once you have been saved, you need to learn how to grow. Uh, I have some grandchildren that are very small. We have another one coming on the way. And uh, that new baby is going to start out with milk and then go on to solid food. And then, you know, more and more uh, enjoyable things. If you can taste the smell, I don't have my taste and smell for the most part, so I don't enjoy it like I used to. But nevertheless, uh, you, you don't always want to be living on milk. That's no fun. You want to have nice, tasty food and be able to chomp into it. I can still chomp it and kind of imagine what it tastes like. 
but uh, one of these days I'm going to get my taste and smell back. But we need to recognize that we must not confuse the rules for living and make them conditions for salvation. Now, there's one man that I just referred to. He has in his commentary in uh, James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, he says this, and if you want to know who I'm talking about, you can go to my notes and that I'll post in reference to this. But he says in a series of 10 commands in James 4, 7 to 10, he says there are 10 imperative verbs in the Greek text. That's true. He says James reveals how to receive saving grace. No, it is not how to receive saving grace. This is written to Christians. And in fact, in the, in the book of James that was written by Christ's half-brother, 14 times he uses the word brethren. Brethren only refers to those that are genuinely saved, not unsaved people. These rules that we have in the scriptures were not for unsaved people. There's only one command to unsaved people, and that is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. You see, the problem in many churches is they go there, and they're taught to live like Christians without getting saved first. You can't do that. You cannot have the fruit of the Spirit, which is produced by the Holy Spirit, and display it unless you genuinely have it. There's a lot of people, you know, that have fake fruit. Now, I have some, you know, I've seen some fake fruit that looks pretty good. Almost you can bite into it until you find out it's plastic, you see. And it may look good, and there's a lot of people who may seem to have the real fruit of the Spirit, but they don't have it in their lives, so they can't demonstrate it at the right time, at the right place, you see. And it's even possible for maturing Christians to misdirect the fruit of the Spirit. That's why in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, the Apostle John says, You maturing believers, stop loving the world system with God's love. The Holy Spirit produced that love in your life. Now stop directing it toward the world. Direct it back to God, you see. And the way you show your love for God is by loving his children primarily. And then if you have enough left over, then you show it toward the unsaved people. You see, when we talk about brethren, in fact, that reminds me of that passage in Matthew 24 and 25. In the Olivet Discourse, he says, Inasmuch as you have done it to these the least my brethren. He's talking about the 144,000 there. He's not talking about the whole populace of the world, see. Uh, these red-letter Christians and some others, uh, they have really uh, twisted the scriptures as... Peter said in 2 Peter chapter, well, he, his whole second epistle is primarily designed, as well as Jude's letter uh, to the Christians. He says, beware of false teachers that are teaching these things. You must read the scriptures and understand to whom he is speaking. Yes, we need to be compassionate to those who are suffering and help when we can, as on an individual basis. But we cannot force, we should not force the government to do something that we ourselves want to do, you see. And this is where a lot of the problems that we ha are having in the world today. And, uh, but, of course, that's another subject in itself. So we have been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Um, that's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. Titus 3, 5 says, It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by his grace. See, we don't deserve to be saved. But now that we have been saved, we need to figure out where is it that we find our rules for living. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this has to do with the house rules. Now, Paul talks about this in first Ephesians chapter 3 as he writes to those believers in the city of Ephesus, and I visited that city uh, a number of years ago. But he went to that city, people got saved. And he said, now, I have been given this commission by God as the steward of this dispensation of grace for you and other Christians. You see, the Apostle Paul is the steward, the household manager, responsible to dispense to those in the household, that is, grace believers, in the New Testament period of time, from the day of Pentecost down to the time of the rapture. He was the one that got the information from God. He wrote it down in the scriptures through the various letters that he wrote to individuals or to churches. And those are the rules that we have for our living for Christians today. See? Now, there are some people who would like to impose the Old Testament rules and regulations upon us, as today they're generally known as Galatianites. Uh, you don't, that's not how you come to spiritual maturity. There are others who would like to impose the Sermon on the Mount upon Christians today, but the Sermon on the Mount was not addressed to Christians. It was addressed to Jews who were anticipating going into the kingdom, the rule of the heavens over the earth. And uh, Jesus had to postpone his uh, setting up of his kingdom until a later date, because in Matthew chapter 16, when he asked Peter, well, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, it's John the Baptist, a few of these other people. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? 
He says, we believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, my father, he said, you didn't come up with that on your own. He says, my father revealed that to you, Peter. But then in, the, in chapter 16 of Matthew 16, 20, he says, now guys, from now on, I don't want you to refer to me anymore as the Christ because I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die, not only for the sins of the Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. Well, Peter didn't like that. And he opposed the Lord and the Lord had to rebuke Peter, but the Lord did change. In fact, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 20 is a hinge point, a very significant one, where Jesus in the last three months of his ministry, of his life, uh, ministry on earth, he, three and a half years, first three years, he was addressing himself just to the Jews. Uh, there were once in a while a few Gentiles that got some benefits and so forth. But generally speaking, he, he was addressing the Jews. Go to Matthew chapter 10. He says, don't go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Go to the house of Israel. And of course, when the Jews uh, didn't accept Christ as their Messiah, he set those that aside. That's why the Jews are temporarily set aside now. And God is dealing primarily with the non-Jew or the Gentiles. And in Romans chapter 11, it says that God is going to, in the future bring Israel back into a place of favor, but until the fullness of the Gentiles, that is those from the Gentile nations, become that the Father has given to the Son, have come to him and been saved, when that number is complete, then the body of Christ will be completed. Christ will come back from heaven to take the body of Christ to that place that he's preparing for us and make us his bride. After that, then shortly after that, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. And that's when chaos is going to develop all of the earth and that he's going to promise the jews a seven-year agreement and he's going to break that agreement in the middle and of course we've talked about that in the past now you see the purpose of dispensation the, these rules in fact in this chart that i've given to you and made reference to many times if you if you'd like to get this uh, just go to my website kelseypeach.com understanding the times download it and read it carefully because it explains uh, to us what we're supposed to do, where we're supposed to find our rules for living. Um, and if you understand this, that these are the rules for my living, these are things that I can learn from. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, learn from the example of the Old Testament believers who sinned against God and were punished. He says, don't behave like they did, or you will expect, you should expect similar consequences. So we don't confuse the Jews with the church. There are two distinct entities. God is not done with the Jews. Uh, Revel uh, Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 are addressed to Jews primarily. In chapter 11, the first verse there, he says, he talks about God's restoring the Jews uh, back and giving them the promises that God unconditionally gave to them. One of which has to do with a land from all the way that goes from the Mediterranean all the way over to the Euphrates River. All these people in these churches that are talking about the Jews don't have that right to that. God has promised that them that land. Go to Genesis chapter 15 verses 18 through 21. He talks about all this land from the Mediterranean all the way over to the Euphrates River. Way up in the north, way up down to the south in Egypt from the, uh, from the Nile River. The Jews are going to get that in the future. Right now, they're fighting over it, and they're wanting the Jews to go back to the 1967 borders that they had. They're having a conflict with the Palestinians. When did the Palestinians come into existence? Uh, they're just so much, and the squabble has been going on for four thousand over 4,000 years, all the way back to the time of Abraham, when he had a son by Hagar, Ishmael. And they think that they have the right to the land. And then you have all the other sons of Abraham through Keturah. It's what was it, six sons. And uh, they have a problem. Then they have the, the, the twin brother of Jacob, who was Esau. So all these guys are interrelated with each other, and they think they all have the right to the land there. Well, God promised certain lands to the, the uh, Edomites, the, half, the, brother of the twin brother, older twin brother of Jacob. He promised land to the uh, sons of Ishmael. And look at all the Arab nations and the, how rich they are materially. And yet everybody seems to want that land that God has promised to give to the Jews. So if we understand this, it will really help us. Now, you see, the purpose of dispensations, or these house rules, and there we believe there are seven identifiable ones, is to demonstrate to mankind that no matter what kind of rules God imposes upon man, man independently of God cannot and will not please God. God told Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden, he said, provide everything that they needed. He says, you can have all, all the fruit from all the trees except the one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> and 
And the devil comes along, Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say that? And did he mean that? There's you have the allegorical interpretation of the scriptures, the beginning of that allegorical interpretation. You know, did God say that? Is that what he mean? And that's what we have today. You see, this is a result, this chart is a result of a literal, normal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Bible. If you go to an allegorical, meaning you can change the Bible any way to say whatever you want, you can go find, you know, Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise. Whatever you do, do quickly. Well, that's part of the scriptures, but it's all out of context, isn't it? So you need to understand that. That's why I want to encourage you to get this chart so it can really help you. Now, even though the Jews failed, and even though Christians today, for the most part, are going to fail, God has given us these rules, and he says now, in Philippians 4.13, Paul writes to those people, and he says, now, uh, or in John 15.5, he says, without me, you can do nothing. But Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things, and every Christian can do everything that God expects us to do in the power, with the power that God provides for us. Philippians 3.10, Paul, Paul says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection so that I can do the things that God wants me to do, so that I can be well-pleasing to him. Not to earn my salvation, not to pay back for my salvation, but to be well-pleasing to God. That's what Paul wanted to do. That's what I want to do. That's what I hope you want to do. So we need to understand that there are different rules for different people in different times. We talked about how the Jews, they had dietary regulations. They had to keep the Sabbath. Uh, they had other things that they needed to do. Uh, let me see what else here. They had um, animal sacrifice. We don't have animal sacrifices today. Uh, we have spiritual sacrifices mentioned in Romans 12, 1 and 2, as well as Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Now, my friend, if you're saved, are you sure you're saved? Um, do you have the assurance that comes from, from the Scripture, as well as from the Holy Spirit himself? Romans 8, 16 says, The Holy Spirit, when you truly trust in Christ as your personal Savior by believing that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that belongs to your mind that you are indeed a child of God. The only part of you that's saved right now, if you're saved, is the spirit that belongs to your mind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. 1 Peter 1, 9 says, There's the future tense salvation of our souls that relates to our bodies. And Romans chapter 8, verse 23 talks about the future tense salvation of our bodies. I don't want to spend eternity in the body that I currently have. I'm thankful for the one that I have. I can still talk, I can still get around, I can still do some things, but it's not going to be nearly as great as the body that I'm going to get in the future when either I uh, go to be with the Lord, I'll get a temporary body until I get this one raised from the dead, or if the Lord were to come back today, it would instantly be changed, made like Christ's glorified, resurrected body, and that's the kind of body that I'm going to have and you will have if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you understand this, this is really going to help you. So the rules for living as I might, as I have in this chart, are generally found between John 13 and Revelation 3. Now keep that in mind. John 13, what happens there? That's in the upper room discourse where Jesus gives his disciples a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The Old Testament standard was you love your neighbor as yourself. You were the standard by which you loved other people. The new commandment is far more intense and it's something that is impossible for us to do unless we're first of all saved, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit who produces this love in us and then we are to direct it toward the, the Lord himself, back to God himself, and toward his children. First Corinthians, or First John 3, 16 and 17 say, if you say you love God and you don't love your, your brother, first of all, and then Galatians 6, 10 says, do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. So that's the order. You love God, you love fellow Christians, and then as you have enough love left over, you show it toward unsaved people as well. So this is where you're going to find your rules for uh, for living for today generally. Now notice, please I say, generally speaking from John 13, when Jesus is talking to his disciples in anticipation of his death, his burial and the resurrection, and he says, you're not going to understand these things very well right now, but when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will bring these things back to your mind. He'll illuminate your mind to it so you can understand it. So generally speaking, the Apostle Paul's writings... He's the steward of this dispensation. Peter and John, uh, who were also disciples of Christ in the Old Testament context, and James and Jude, who are the half-brothers of Jesus, these are the ones where we're going to find our rules for living for today. Now, after Revelation chapter 3, you don't find the church here on earth. So we believe that from John 13, where Jesus gives a new commandment, all the way down to Revelation 3, this is the primary context in which you're going to find your rules for living for today. Now, maybe you never heard that, but think about it. 
as I mentioned, the Sermon on the Mount was not addressed to Christians. Now, there's some principles that are similar to what we're, we've been given. The Mosaic Law, all their 600 and some rules that they had, they're not designed for us. The Old Testament Ten Commandments were designed were a negative thing. Don't, 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 don't. We're, our principles are love God. This When you love somebody, you're not going to do all these other things. So it's a positive thing. The Old Testament Ten Commandments were uh, basically a negative thing. So when we understand this, this will really help us to grow as God wants us to go. Now you see, the church has not replaced Israel. God has a future for the nation of Israel. And uh, I know there's a lot of Jews and there's a lot of churches who, by the way, are contributing toward anti-Semitism by saying there's no future for the Jews. And these Jews that are over in Israel right now, they're saying they are occupiers. No, they are not occupiers. That's the land that God promised to them. And if you're uh, trying to boycott Israel and divest and all these other things from the nation of Israel, in spite of the fact that they, a lot of them are there in the land since 1948 in unbelief, God is going to deal with them. And particularly after the church is gone, then God's time clock with the Jews is going to start up as soon as the Antichrist signs his agreement, his seven-year agreement, with the Jewish nation. And as I mentioned, this new world order that man is planning is going to last only for seven years, and it's going to be defunct totally when Jesus Christ comes back and destroys that whole system. And it's mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. It goes back to the battle of the, this head of gold, the Babylonian Empire, the chest of silver, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, uh, Medo Empire. The legs are the thighs of bronze, representing the Grecian Empire. The legs representing the iron of the uh, Roman Empire. The ten toes of iron and, and clay represent the revived Roman Empire. Now, you see, that's, gonna, that's about ready to take place, we believe. Now, we don't set dates for the return of the Lord, but we believe it could be very imminent. So we don't believe that the church has replaced Israel. That's a great disservice. And we don't believe that, you know, the Jews are saved a different way than we do. There's a guy on TV that I've listened to. He says there's a dual covenant. We don't need to evangelize the Jews. Yes, we do. The Apostle Paul was a devout Pharisee and he encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus. God knocked him to the ground and and he came to become a believer in Jesus Christ, recognizing that he was God. He is God. And that he's the one who died for our sins and rose again. And the Apostle Paul suffered much for insisting that this is the gospel message. And he insisted on the bodily resurrection as well. Now, if you go to a church that doesn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ or that his death for our sins and his burial, you need to find a different church. You, see, you need to be in a church that you can encourage the pastor where they're not ecumenical, they're not trying to bring in the one world government, the one world church. There's a lot of churches that are doing that this day, these days. Now, on this chart, uh, toward the bottom, I have, I'm, I'm open to get to this, but on the bottom, it's a responsibilities, failures, and then down here, it talks about the judgment of what's going to happen to the church. And, of course, there's a few things. God wants us to, first of all, grow in the sphere of grace. He wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit, maintain Christian unity, use our spiritual gift, love others as Christ loves us, witness to and evangelize the lost, do all for the glory of God. And most of the people in the church, even though they're saved, most of them don't do that. And so at the very bottom, it talks about what's going to happen in the judgment on the Day of Judgment. We're not going to lose our salvation, but we could lose a lot of rewards and crowns that could have been and should have been ours and which we would have had become our own, which we then would be able, when we see Christ, to offer them back to him as our expression of gratitude to him for the grace that he extended to us in providing salvation for us as human beings. Now, I know I've given you a lot of information here, but I would like to encourage you. I'm going to have a corresponding article that will uh, relate to this and a lot of scripture references. I, want you to, I would like to encourage you to look up these references. Make time to do it. Uh, there might come a day when we will have our Bibles confiscated from us, as they are in many countries. And what you have in your mind is going to be very important when you're trying to talk to somebody about the Lord. You need to have the proper message and the proper method. We're saved by God's grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel message. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, apart from your good works, and you'll be saved. That's, in essence, what we do. Now, once we have been saved... There are a lot of rules and regulations that stem out of this commandment to love one another 
as I have loved you. That's what Jesus said. And when you're doing this, you're loving God, you're loving his children, you're not going to be doing all the negative things that are mentioned in the Ten Commandments. And I hope this has been helpful for you. And if you have questions or comments, uh, please send them to us. If you like it, please push share and like so that some of your friends can get a hold of it as well. And so until next time, my friend, this is Kelsey Peach asking God's blessing upon you as you are obedient to him and his word.